Um, morning, everybody. I do want to thank uh, Monique and the Bot Steber Foundation for um, being so gracious to pull this together and um, uh, bring many familiar faces and, and friends and colleagues uh, to have this important discussion. Um, what I'd like to do today is I'll do a very brief overview of some of our uh, research findings over the last 10 years, but my, my primary focus today is kind of share with you what I perceive. Again, this is my uh, view from, from many, many uh, hours, days, and years in the field on where does fertility control fit into the whole equation, right? Where is it realistic? Where is it not? Uh, try to put it in context. So you get the two extremes. Uh, you have folks that think we can universally manage all wildlife across the United States with fertility control, and then we have those that think you can only do it in a box that's three by three feet. Um, so I want to kind of uh, paint a picture on what is realistic um, based on the technology we have today. Uh, as Stephanie mentioned, I've spent many, many years uh, trying to refine our capture uh, technologies to make some of these programs that we're involved with today feasible. Um, working with folks like Mark and HSUS um, that are developing vaccines that will, um, and I want to make clear that um, I am not here to advocate for anything. We try to just generate data and then folks can use those as they wish. Um, I am clearly uh, not opposed to vaccination of wildlife. Um, the reason I am doing surgical sterilization is, as Alan said, um, we were at the same table, but two years prior, in 1991, I sat with Jay and John Turner, and we were laughing how absurd it would be uh, to surgically um, <laughs> render wildlife infertile. Um, and here I am today, um, <laughs> feeling like a fool. But, um, and I'm sure Jay's laughing at me. But, uh, but the point was, um, if I'm a very impatient person, for those that know me. And, um, and we kept saying, five more years, five more years, so the vaccine's ready and it's registered. And I'm like, I am tired of being asked, you know, what can we do with a fertility control methodology? So I'm like, the heck of it. We're gonna go back old school and at least go into the field and see what type of population level impact we can achieve by rendering females, at least of deer for now, uh, infertile and looking at how populations change. So that was really, this is what this talk is about. So I am not trying to advance, you know, the management of deer with surgical sterilization. I'm asking questions on how we, what's realistic in terms of population changes that can be incurred purely by using um, infertility methods. All right, so we are a small nonprofit. Uh, we've been around for a little while now. And, um, and again, I could recognize most faces in the room. And, and I, I do want to repeat, you know, the Bot Steber Foundation, I'm, I'm very grateful. It, it is most important. Uh, the educational phase, I'm, I'm starting to realize, as much as some folks feel as though, and there are many close-minded people, I'm pointing to the gal behind Mark, um, that, uh, you know, won't listen to facts, right? But we are also at fault because we don't have a lot of good data. Right? And we haven't pulled these, these case studies together in a comprehensive way that tells a clear story that people can then follow. So that's kind of my next phase of life, I think. Um, maybe. Um, we have a broad audience here, um, so I kind of have to think about how to message things and, and what to cover. But in a very short sense, um, these are your kind of options if you're going with a, um, a non-lethal, a fertility control-based approach. And, you know, Alan did a nice job just doing the, you know, these are kind of our two vaccine-based methods. Um, still in registration process, refinement of development. I think there's some uh, talks this afternoon on, you know, how are we making these better? Um, and then the surgical approach, um, there's some history, we'll call it, with um, some research that's taken place, and it's kind of painted a tainted picture, as I call it, of what a surgical method can accomplish. And that was done up at Cornell. And they, and I'll say this, they foolishly um, decided to use tubal ligations on deer, which incurred an extended um, estrus period that resulted in an abundance of males, and there's a long story behind that, that case study, that reflected that it was infeasible to reduce the deer population. But yet we have a case study in the adjoining village, which literally abuts Cornell's campus, and we have incurred a very substantial reduction in population uh, just by doing ovariectomies. Um, so, um, these are kind of our options, and we have to um, understand the vasectomy. That's like a whole other talk, but it is an option. 
Um, and we are working uh, with that method on, on a project on, on Staten Island, but we're not gonna get into that, uh, that case study today. Um, so what I'm trying to do, again, is we wanna see if I treat a very high percentage of animals, um, primarily females, and render them infertile, how does that population change, right? Do we have changes in immigration? Changes in immigration. There was some data showing that uh, females that don't get pregnant seem to wander more in the landscape. Does that expose them to increased mortality, right? How are they moving in this landscape? Uh, the, the project we're doing on Staten Island, working on males, um, we're trying to intensively monitor with um, uh, quite high sample sizes using GPS collars and looking at those, behavior, those subtle behavioral changes that might occur due to these treatments. Uh, and ultimately, cost is a factor, right? We're trying to also figure out, working with like my friends here in Clifton, um, how do we mitigate these costs by having volunteers involved and other ways to, to make these programs uh, more cost effective with local support. All right, so this is again, just to show that we have demonstrated um, if you treat a high percentage of females in a local population, this is not an island, this is not closed, these are open suburban populations um, with deer on all sides, um, that we have very, very low immigration to so far, right? We're still, you know, we're still quantifying that over time. As we've already shown in many, we have one case study which still to this day, and I've seen a lot of crazy things in my years, as you can imagine. Um, we have been overly successful in, in, a, in, a, in a private community in California where they are panicked that we have now decimated their herd by surgically sterilizing their females. And they have cut holes in their fence and they're trying to entice outside deer into their community again. And I am, to this moment, it blows my mind. So they have pictures, and, and because deer follow Patrick, they have pictures of some of these um, untagged females jumping the fence coming in, but they don't stay, they leave. And then we have some of our tagged ones near the edge that are exiting and kind of coming and going, but they still haven't gotten any females that have come in in six years that have fawned. And we've dropped from nearly 175 animals and we're down to about 60. Um, and that's with no lethal intervention. Um, so they're in this panic mode, they're all gonna disappear. Anyway, um, so it can work. Um, there's, there's no question. Uh, we've shown these, these uh, population impacts, um, very low, low mortality rates, much of which uh, those are, most of the mortality we experience are pre-existing conditions. Uh, you have animals that have ailments that we have no way how old they are, uh, whatever other uh, prior experiences they've had. It's not like we're bringing your dog into a clinic and we can do blood profiles and, and really get an understanding of that animal's health before we engage it with, with anesthetic drugs. Um, anyway, so this works, right? In, in concept. So now it's where can it work, right? So why, and so I try to stay out of the politics and I won't spend a lot of time with it, but why would we use it, right? And so I'm looking at this not from uh, a group that has a, um, um, an interest in trying to promote any particular method. I don't care if people manage deer at all, to be honest. Um, but why would you do it? So when I go into a situation, um, I try to uh, be as objective as possible. I take input, right? Like John said, you know, what does the community really want? What are the conflicts? Uh, and how can I best serve them to meet their objectives, right? That's my job, um, right, as I see it. Um, and, and we work diligently to, to accomplish that. But there are situations where a community may say, we want to do X, and we don't want to spend too much money. How do we get there? So we've done research on what can you accomplish with bow hunting, right? With proficiency tested individuals, uh, using bait, extended seasons, unlimited tags. What is realistic in these environments where deer have refugia? Deer get smart. They quickly learn how to avoid people, right? So if somebody wants to see a, an appreciable reduction in their population below which you know, bow hunting, for example, can accomplish that goal, I'll tell you right up front, we have those data, it's not gonna work, right? What works, what doesn't work? Again, what I'm trying to accomplish with our fertility control data. What can we do with sharpshooting? I've been in environments, and we're pretty creative, um, but ultimately, we have to have a degree of discretion, no matter what I'm doing, whether I have a dark gun out in the field, um, whether you have a, um, uh, you're carrying a deer on a stretcher, you still have to appreciate how the public is viewing that, right? And so we have to have some discretion. So, you know, how visible would a lethal program be, right? That's something we have to weigh. And then ultimately, safety is the most important thing. So I have to gauge, I'm never gonna conduct myself in an unsafe manner, so that's gonna put constraints 
on how I would normally work. And if there's too many houses and too many things going on, my ability to be effective with a lethal tool can get to zero. And I know of several places, and I can rattle them off right now, where I know I cannot use a lethal tool to solve the problem, period. No matter how much somebody wants to get that done, with all my creative thinking, for what it's worth, I know I cannot meet the threshold of their interest with a lethal method. It's that simple. So from my perspective as, an, as, a, as a biologist that's trying to solve problems, there are sight characteristics that say bow hunting, sharpshooting, these other methods will not work. I've seen them, I've tried to work in them, I've tried to be successful, and we fail, okay? So, and I don't like to fail. So there are really, truly situations where fertility control is the only option. And that's basically because we procrastinated too long and nobody's done anything, and now the deer are living in very, very challenging environments and are quite comfortable there. Um, you're gonna see this over and over. Um, Alan, I know he's very frustrated because he's got his legal arena he fights, right? Um, I have my own legal battles. Uh, every state I go in is different, right? I got the, uh, my colleagues from Maryland, right? They still have an old school law where you can't discharge a firearm within 450 feet of an occupied structure. Related to hunting, there's several other states. New Jersey has the same uh, constraint. So these are unrealistic relative to the professional tools and skills that we uh, employ, and yet, yeah, it curbs our ability to meet objectives. But this is the two-edged sword. So there's some situations where you cannot discharge a firearm, right? So now you're at archery. Archery is very limited. Well, I can use my dart gun because it's not a firearm in most situations. That opens some options for me. But then we have a state like Michigan that's now decided that they don't, you know, well, not they, but some folks that represent uh, the residents of Michigan um, do not want to allow any fertility control of wildlife, and they're trying to pass a law that would prohibit that. Um, and so these legal elements are real, and, and they come in many different flavors. They're not just policies. They are hard, cut-and-stone laws that are very difficult, like Alan said. You know, these aren't priority issues for the legislature, whether it's vaccination you know, registration or whether it's changing of firearm discharge restriction um, you know, for deer management just not a priority. So we have to continue to work around these because I don't expect many of them to change anytime soon. Um, I value, obviously, public interest, um, but that's, you know, and I have to take that into account, but from my perspective, I look more at the te technical logistical, but there's clearly situations. For example, NIST, where HSUS has worked for many years, they're not gonna allow culling on that property. It would be safe, it would be legal, you can go through all those check boxes, but they're not gonna allow it. And so therefore, it's not an option um, from their mind, and therefore, fertility control is a very viable option. Um, and then, because all I do is, is create uh, very uh, challenging um, uh, scenarios in which we work, um, I don't really look at this, the safety is always obviously a concern, but it's, it's very manageable, right? So I don't blow out a proportion that someone's gonna get killed if, you know, and no matter what you do. Um, but there's situations where those safety concerns, as I said earlier, restrict our ability to use lethal methods to the point where I can go out with a dark gun, and I can drive around roads at night and discharge a dark gun with no risk to the public, right? I can't do that with a firearm. Um, there's some redundancy uh, in, in these sequences, but you'll see these patterns, which is legal stuff, right? It drives me nuts, right? So you have legal issues continually come up, but the site characteristics are always um, a huge issue. And then the, um, I used acceptance here, but it's, it's more a matter of um, how does the public view this, right? So now um, we have hunters that still, amazingly to me, find fertility control threatening uh, to their form of recreation. Can't even comprehend it. Um, the scope and scale of which we've done research and management projects for the last 30 years is so absurdly small, uh, but yet it elicits an immense um, averse reaction, um, like in Michigan, where someone's gonna take the effort and time of the legislature to try to pass a bill that would prevent you from doing fertility control. Economics prevents that. There's many other factors. Our technologies, right? We're already hamstrung so severely. You don't need a law that specifically outlaws it. Nonetheless, and then we have advocates that are what I consider unrealistic, right? They expect 
us professionally and, and developing vaccines and, and organizations to perform miracles with fertility control. We're just not there yet, right? So we have pushed from that fact, from those groups. We have animal rights groups that don't want any deer touch. So even though we're doing uh, fertility control or we're doing sterilization, they'll find a fence that those animals are being handled and manipulated. And those people can be very vocal uh, and they can help undermine, you know, when I consider good intention projects, trying to meet you know, objectives in a, in a very balanced way. But those folks have a loud voice, and when you have you know, the social media that we do, it can be, it can be a very powerful voice. Um, and we still, you know, um, and, and it's unfortunate, I'm very grateful that you know, colleagues from, from Maryland came up, but we don't really have any state agency represent, representation here to speak of. Um, um, and that's part of my goal long term, is to really be able to communicate and get them uh, more aligned with what are these realities and, and what's realistic permitting and what value does it have. I still have many colleagues that still can't, they still say, well, just go bow hunt. I'm like, you don't understand where these deer are. And if I thought I could solve the problem that way, I would consider it, but I can't. I literally can't solve the problem. So you must work with us to help these communities solve these problems. So the whole social element still gives me agita as it does most folks in the room. Um, <laughs> We have a delayed, there's, over, there's obviously a delayed timeline, right? We are inhibiting fertility, but we're not incurring additional mortality in most situations. We do have a project now in Ann Arbor where we're using a joint method. Um, again, somewhat obvious, right? You combine two methods, you usually get some additional benefit, um, but we're trying to prove the obvious in some regards and document these, these relative values, where if you have the social capacity to mix lethal and non-lethal, it makes the most sense. And you can minimize lethal long-term, you could possibly transition to a fully non-lethal program, but you accelerate the reduction in conflicts by seeing a, a more rapid timeline. And you always don't have to look, I look at it as, you're not adding lethal to non-lethal, you're adding non-lethal to lethal, right? Uh, Steffi and I, we were chatting with uh, Rock Creek Park, the national park system, right? They're going to sharpshoot. Well, why not add fertility control? Because it can enhance your ability to impact that population and possibly reduce your long-term costs and associated um, management needs by having continued culling, right? So it's not always we're trying to lessen non-lethal. We're trying to supplement and, I think, complement some of the lethal tools that, that might be presently used. Um, Cost is always on any issue, right? It's, it's a reality, whether it's how much effort and time it takes to produ produce these vaccines, which is a big part of why things move slowly. Uh, we're not talking tens of thousands of dollars, you're talking millions of dollars to develop these technologies. Um, and that's spread over a long time period. And we're dealing often with deer, which reproduce once a year. So your data cycles are very protracted. Um, in the field, it takes a ton of work. Don't get me wrong, I would far rather dart a deer remotely with a vaccine, then dart a deer, carry the son of a gun, especially Ohio deer, carry those sons of guns up steep terrain and then do surgery on them and release them. Right? So I very much would like to see a lower cost, easier solution that we can all gravitate towards, which is, again, another benefit of having a conference that pulls these discussions forward. Um, and then, for example, in Pennsylvania, they will not allow you to use fertility control as a sole method of management because their thought is, and there's some merit to it, um, that then you're managing by deer vehicle collision, right? You may eliminate reproduction, but those populations only get to kind because they're getting hit by cars. They die of other things, but so therefore it's not reasonable. But then I would argue is, well, then if they do nothing, then you perpetuate high levels of DVCs and they never decline, but you can get any circular arguments all you want. Um, and the next question is, and, and Alan published on it with Rick, on um, you know, are we impacting deer vehicle collisions via these treatments? Right? Are we causing them to increase based on the behavioral changes that we might incur with vaccination or surgery? So those questions are still being answered that I'm interested in. And in particular, for example, on Staten Island, um, that's one of the big questions is if, if we vasectomize males and they are uh, ineffectively breeding females, and those females don't get pregnant, they're gonna come into estrogen, skin, similar to a PZP type treatment. And does that increase the rate of deer vehicle collisions during you know, the post normal breeding season? And so we're trying to quantify those. Are these males moving more? Do they, uh, just based on these females in asterisk, does the other um, factors, which is basically daylight that cuts down testosterone, reduce movement. So we're trying to intensively monitor uh, males in that environment 
we have we got some amazing data. Um, just got to get them analyzed, but you know that's one of those pesky details. Um, uh, and so, and this is back to, and I really wanted to bring this up because sometimes I feel as though, um, and, and I want us to work as a community towards solving problems, right? So it's not an us versus them. There, there are which method is best, and it's, there's no best method. It's what is the situation you're in. Fire Island was perfect, super approachable deer, right? You can hit them with blow pipes, identify them individually by markings. You use a vaccine, it's kind of a no-brainer, right? Um, there's other situations um, where it's much more complicated. And as Alan got to, and I'm gonna pick his brain at lunch, because um, I can never really stay on top of what's happening in Mark as well, Mark Fraker, you know, they're trying to get these vaccines registered. And what's really happening, you know, we got this federal level, the state level, where are we in this process? What can we really do? It's still not really, I don't feel, cut and dry. That's why I'm actually excited about this afternoon's talk and cornering Alan when I get a chance. Um, but so right now, you can't use a vaccine unless it's presently registered, which is Zonastat and, and Gonacon uh, in New Jersey and Maryland, because they allow management of deer, and then those are registered agents to use it. But that's it. You've got 48 other states, right? You've got a lot of other constraints, so do we have to do everything still under the guise of research, um, which is, so actually Maryland's probably one of the most progressive states, because they will actually allow you to manage deer, manage deer with fertility control, right? Um, so those legal elements are still in play. Um, it's far easier for me just to get a permit from the state wildlife, not in every state, but get a permit from the state wildlife agency and do a surgery than it is to get permission to use a vaccine for doing the same type of population level research. Um, I'm gonna get into this one. This is really, and you're all probably gonna look at me like I'm crazy when I get there, but hopefully I can explain to you what kind of spins in my head all the time um, within a 30 minute time period. Um, what is site suitability? It's hard um, because I've worked in so many areas with so many different subtleties about road density, lot size, deer approachability, all these things. There is a clear, at this point, um, it's, a, it's kind of a, an intuition. <laughs> um, when I look at something on Google Earth and I go, that one's pretty easy. And I look at that one, I go, that's gonna be a nightmare, right? Um, and it's, it's trying to share that with others so that they don't just go, I'm a suburban community, therefore I can use fertility control. I was like, no, nah, it's not that straightforward. If you want to be successful, there's some very detailed level elements that I, I will, uh, I'll get into. I'm trying to watch my own time here so I don't overwhelm you. Um, the general rule, um, we published on this probably three or four years ago, um, is if your site suitability is challenging, and your deer aren't so approachable, they're not what I, I always refer to Fire Island deer, um, you're gonna lean towards a permanent approach, right? Surgical sterilization right now in some of these situations is still by far the most cost-effective long-term method. If you have deer that are easily approachable, um, mostly via vehicle, um, and they're relatively, uh, we'll call it, I used to use a tame or, or um, in, in a way that you can treat them, what I call treat them or engage them, and the next day they're not that much worse for wear. Some deer, you have one engagement with them, you may never see them again, right? So if we have deer that are on that spooky side, you wanna get a dart in them once and you never wanna see them again, because you may not. You're not gonna have that opportunity to give a second injection with a vaccine that would allow you to maintain infertility in that individual. Um, and then effectiveness, we're on a small scale. Right? In theory, if we have a competent vet, um, you can have 100% effectiveness with a surgical approach. Our vaccines still vary between 85, 95%. Um, you know, we have some areas where you could treat, like good friends in, in Clifton, you can treat 90% of your females, but your mortality rates are so low, you don't see a precipitous decline, right? So if we had a vaccine that were much reduced in effectiveness, you may see zero effect, even if you have 85 or 90% of your females treated. Right? So those are real considerations on which method you're going to use based on that specific location. Um, and, and deer behavior, like I said, always ties back in with sight. I mean, that, that is just because you come home at night and the deer stands in your driveway and doesn't get out of your way doesn't mean that I'm going to be able to dart 100% of them. That I can tell you. 
Um, and, and this is kind of where I want to wrap up, is where can we realistically do this, all right? Um, how big? Big is one relative component of it. Big is cost, right? Not always, right, because one of the weirdest, one of the weirdest sites I've ever been to is Fairfax uh, City, Virginia. You look at Fairfax City, Virginia on Google Earth, you're gonna swear there's gonna be 600 deer in that six square miles. Because I know in the parks adjoining we have 100 deer per square mile. I know a lot of those communities have a tremendous abundance. In Fairfax City, they have 15 deer per square mile. It is still the biggest mystery on this planet as far as I'm concerned. And I have not solved it yet, but nonetheless, um, that's six square miles, pretty big, pretty challenging, but at 15 deer per square mile, you don't have to handle a large volume of deer. We have not seen immigration. We've seen substantial population reduction. We're down to six deer per square mile. You can't imagine it. You can't find deer there. We will drive with three vehicles for nine hours a night, and you'll see two deer, All right? Very challenging. So scope isn't so important. We're presently working on Staten Island, which is 60 square miles. Some days I think I'm crazy, and some days I think I have it under control, and it kind of goes back and forth. That's the bipolar aspect of it. Um, road network is critical, and I don't mean to demean the Fire Island. The Fire Island's like the, this D case study, right? It's always been out there. You know, that's like the Twilight Zone. Lovely place, but Twilight Zone. Um, <laughs> you gotta have roads. You've got to be able to efficiently get to deer. And in areas where deer are used to cars, which is suburbia, right? That is a, a very critical method of interfacing with an animal that doesn't quite have that full capacity to perceive a vehicle as a threat. And that vehicle, it sees every day by the thousands. So it would be running itself crazy if it's, every time it saw a deer, it had a flight response. So they have to become immune to that, and I take advantage of that. Very, very critical. More roads, more densely roaded, the more I can interface with those deer, and the more rapidly I can get to them, whether I'm just capturing or whether I have to capture, transport, and actually do a procedure. Um, scope, budget, right? So if you looked at Staten Island, we have an almost unimaginable budget uh, for that project. But you have to. You've got 60 square miles. It's just insanity. Um, but you could take that budget and go five-fold what we're doing right now, and if we were pursuing females, it would not succeed. The road network there and the development pattern is such, for those of you that have had the, the opportunity to visit Staten Island, and I do recommend you go if you have some chance, um, there's parks and then there's concrete. That's Staten Island, right? Manhattan's concrete. There's a mix. And so those deer are very hard to get to because I can only get along the edges. And some of these parks are 600 acres, 1,000 acres. They're big blocks. So I don't have that vehicle network. And I have to systematically bait those animals and bring them in and try to dart them. If we had to do all the females that way, you would never get enough females to be successful. And that's, as a sidelight, that's why we're doing males in that circumstance for a multitude of reasons. But budget's not always the solution, right? There are some other factors that come into play. You can dump as much money as you want. It just will not be feasible. Um, and then there's my favorite again. Um, you know, how do, how do we work around um, uh, some of these particular constraints? My favorite one, and I saw a strong uh, visitation from New Jersey, um, they interpret their community-based deer management um, regulations to say that whatever you're doing underneath one of their permits, you have to have written permission from every affected, is the word, affected landowner. So if I dart a deer on your property and it runs two doors down and goes to sleep, I would have had to have in advance written permission to retrieve that deer. Even if I'm not doing surgery, even if I'm vaccinating it, just to get to that deer, give it an injection of vaccine and carry on. So they kind of came up with an arbitrary 2,000 foot discharge restriction where if you're gonna dart somewhere, you need written permission from everyone within 2,000 feet in case that deer happens to fall on their, on their backyard. Game's over. You're not doing fertility control 
in New Jersey. Not going to happen. So until somebody changes that, and I've already, it's been 11 years, we wrote language that no one has taken the initiative to submit to the state to get an exemption for fertility control for this affected landowner, right? The premise behind it was, you're not going to go out and bow hunt or sharpshoot on somebody's property without their permission. No one's really thinking about if you're capturing deer in a suburban environment. But nobody, again, collectively, you know, I've worked with Princeton, I've worked with other communities there, somebody needs to change that. Or in, in New Jersey, legal restriction, you're not doing fertility control. Pennsylvania is a policy issue. There's not a restriction in Pennsylvania. It's a policy issue around whether you're managing um, with fertility control or whether, you know, as a, at a high level versus a maintenance. So you're trying to reduce with fertility control, they don't allow as of now. But if you're maintaining a population with fertility control where DVCs aren't your source of population reduction, they would consider it. Um, anyway, so that's a big uh, factor there that we're dealing with. So let me, and deer behavior, I don't even get into that anymore because they just rule my life. Um, this is what I want to spend a little time on before I get shut down. All right, this is, this is the village of Cayuga Heights. This is right next to um, Cornell's campus. Uh, this is a portion of the community. Um, if you look, a lot of roads. This is an elementary school. We can drive through here. There's a little block of woods here. But these deer can't be anywhere where I can't find them. Or if I see them back in here, I got a radio collar on one, and there's four others in the group, as soon as I see them walk in a direction, I just sit here. And as soon as they go across the road, I just happen to be driving by. I stop. And those deer, and I'm riding with a police officer, those deer have no concept of what's going on. Stop the car, dart an animal, and I'll usually dart all of them. Um, but so in this situation, very doable. We captured every female in two square miles here in 10 days, uh, 137 females. Um, so we can go through animals fast if I have this. Now this. I almost got a little too confident on, I will admit. Um, this is East Hampton, um, New York. These are, all three of these are the same scale uh, on Google Earth, just so you can appreciate. Look at these lots. Quite a few roads, you know, it looks kind of reasonably accessible, but these are, some of these are like three, four, five acres. That's probably 200 yards in between those roads. There's a lot of turf in there where a deer can be for a lot of hours at night, where I might see them with a spotlight behind the house, I can't get to them. And there's not enough roads. You need like two more roads in here, right? Because then if they don't move much, that'll be my new plan for East Hampton. Um, um, add more roads. Um, but the likelihood of these deer crossing that road and then being able to time it is very challenging. Right? For you sitting in a room right now watching this presentation, that means nothing. But when I'm out at four in the morning, and I've been doing this week after week, apologize, um, Watching a stupid deer in the middle of that backyard every night, I'll pull my hair out. I can't get to them, right? And then if there's enough of them and there's about 100 deer per square mile in East Hampton, they get a little smart and you lose that one opportunity that took you four nights to get, you will never get that opportunity again. And now that deer has two fawns next year, right? And so I lose sleep over these. And then there's my friends from Cincinnati. Um, this is them. Uh, this is Mount Storm Park. Now, I'll get into it a little bit, but you can see now we have a large block. So what I get is a lot of people that come to me and go, we got a park, you know, it's perfect, the deer are friendly. I'm like, how big is the park? And are there a lot of roads in it? Because if there's not, this is a nightmare. Um, not quite a nightmare, but it gives me agita. Um, so here it is, here's blown up further, okay? I want you to really appreciate, this is Cayuga, village of Cayuga, it's up near Ithaca, New York. Um, so this is, uh, this is the elementary school, um, this is kind of their town center, there's an uh, uh, old folks home up here, which I'm about ready, I can almost join that. Uh, there's a couple stretches here, a little bit of, of broader um, landscape, but this is all barren woods, really steep hillside, deer rarely over here. Um, I know every deer in that community. And I know when a face shows up, I know who they are, I could find them, I could work through that thing. Not easy, but it's very, very feasible. Um, here's East Hampton, right? This, very doable. All the deer in this neighborhood, poof, done, no sweat, that was easy. Get a golf course, pretty big here, and there's some shenanigans that go on there, and uh, so these deer aren't real happy to see people. Um, 
And then you've got these bigger lots here. And so you really, when you look at your community, this is a scale, the 500 scale on Google. Um, look at your map before you start getting excited on whether you could do this or not. If you have this, yeesh. Um, if you have this, piece of cake. All right? It is that subtle. And then how many big parks, like most golf courses, you can walk out there and dart deer. These folks here do a little, we'll call it uh, uh, selective removal uh, illegally that uh, makes deer smart. Um, and then here's Clifton. So if you look here, this is awesome, right? These deer here are easy. Um, here, when I first got there, I could walk, park the truck up here, I could walk down the hill, the deer are out grazing my cattle. I just walk in my backyard at night and I would shoot them. Boom, 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 boom. And bring them in, do surgery, um, everything's great. But there were a lot of deer. So by the time I got through all those deer, and we would bait and sit over dark sites, you know, so we, we've got 91% of the females captured here, which is great, but it's not 100%. And there's still a group that gives me Adger, and that's my favorite word, that lives in his area. They come to bait every once in a while when they feel like it at 3 in the morning. It gives Lori fits because they won't come, like most deer, every afternoon at 5 o'clock, and we sit there and we dart them and we carry on. So it doesn't take many of those in a situation like this to undermine your ability to really see a population decline, particularly here. This is a pretty benign environment. Our deer vehicle collisions are very small. It's not like some areas where our mortality rates are higher and you can see these more rapid population declines. So again, um, as we do more and more case studies, this seems like it would be a great area. And it's not that big. We're only dealing with a square mile. So we're coming over here on the east side. We come across the south. And so it's not that big. It's just this. So I got to keep, you know, we keep working on how do we outsmart those last ones. And can you outsmart them fast enough where they're not having enough fawns where the fawns come up and I can't get to them before I start shutting that group down? It's doable. We'll get them. Um, but it's just... You look at that, and most people can't see the difference between this and this and this. It's a huge difference. So um, Hastings and the Hudson was supposed to speak on this afternoon. That's a very challenging environment. It's suburban, you know, suburban USA, but it's not this. And this is kind of really what would make us most successful. And then we can, there's some other elements, right? The approachability factor. There's some other components, but this is about the extent you want to get. You don't want some big park. We have a big park. I'm like, I don't want a big park. Don't say big park. Say, I got them all in the neighborhood because then I can get the job done. Um, anyway, hopefully that was a little enlightening. Um, and, but I, I think knowing that we could be effective with non-lethal and it's really just making sure um, people make smart decisions on where you apply the method.